Okay, um, so starting with the main content, uh, this time I'd like to talk about document level models. So um, before I go through uh, document level models, I'd like to go through some NLP tasks that we've handled so far and uh, make connections to the tasks that we're going to be doing on the document level or the larger discourse level. Um, so one uh, task that we've done so far is language modeling. So predicting the uh, probability of a text or the next word in a text. Um, so this is one. Uh, we've also talked about uh, parsing. So figuring out the syntactic or other wise underlying structure of uh, texts. And we've also talked about things like classification. Um, one example that we've used uh, profusely being sentiment analysis, but of course there's lots of other types of classification. And also we talked about entity tagging. So um, within a single sentence, entity uh, named entity recognition, for example. So um, all of these tasks uh, we can think about on a document level as well. And that's what uh, this class is going to be about. So we're going to talk about document level language modeling. So predicting language on the multiple sentence level uh, in contrast to single sentence language modeling. Also document classification. So predicting the traits of entire documents. Um, so this is in contrast to sentence classification. Entity co-reference, figuring out which entities correspond to each other uh, within uh, the context of a discourse, uh, in contrast to named entity recognition, where we're just identifying entities. And also discourse parsing, how do segments of a document correspond with each other? So in this, um, uh, we can think of this kind of as a way of prediction in uh, using documents or prediction of documents, whereas uh, these ones are more like prediction of document uh, structure itself. So first I'm going to talk about document level language modeling. And when I say language modeling, um, of course, I think we should all be familiar by now that um, any language model can also be turned into a conditional language model. So this could be even um, all the underlying, you know, components that we have here, I'm going to be talking about them from a language modeling perspective, but they could just as easily be turned into a document level machine translation model or a document level, um, uh, you know, language generation model or something like that. So for document level language modeling, uh, we want to predict the probability of words in an entire document. Um, and obviously sentences in the document don't exist in a vacuum and we want to take advantage of the fact. So if we have recurrent neural networks, um, if you remember uh, you know, all the way back to the very early parts of this class, these are models that pass previous information um, by passing along a hidden state between predictions in a particular, uh, particular sentence. So, you know, you input I, um, you predict I, then input I and update your hidden state. You predict hate, you um, then input hate and update your hidden state, et cetera. And normally I'd been explaining this uh, on the sentence level, but a very simple way to do um, document level uh, language modeling is to simply pass the state from the previous um, sentence into the next sentence. And in fact, in language modeling uh, nowadays, this is uh, very useful and it's pretty standard to um, uh, train models without even respecting sentence boundaries and just take a equally sized chunk of you know 256 words or something like that when you're training your models. Um, so one uh, problem with this, however, is that it can be difficult to uh, pass um, information between sentence to sentence. And the reason why is basically, if you look um, here, uh, we're just passing this in this long linear chain. 
So there are more, um, you know, many, many steps between the thing at the very beginning and the, uh, and the thing at the end. Um, so it is also common to have a separate encoding for uh, coarse grained document context in addition to the fine grained encoding of a single sentence uh, context. Um, and so uh, what we can do is we can have um, one big, uh, so uh, yes, so sorry. Uh, what it looks like is essentially in addition to having, you know, our single word level RNN, we can also have a, a separate uh, context here. And this was first introduced by uh, Mikulov and Zweig in uh, 2012. So then the, the question becomes uh, essentially what context do we want to be incorporating? And um, we, uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, the first attempts to do so used topic modeling. So they used a separate topic model to induce the topic, topics in the sentence. Um, another way that's extremely simple is you just pass in the bag of words of a previous sentence, optionally with, um, with some sort of attention mechanism. So uh, in other words, you just uh, find all the, the words in the previous sentence, you add up their uh, you know, embeddings, and you pass this on. And the idea why you would want to do something like this is because um, we figure that the information that we get from previous documents is the most important thing is to know about the overall topic of the sentence. And if we just need to know about the overall topic, we don't really need to um, uh, worry about word order or any other things like this. So this is uh, very computationally easy and feasible. And another thing we can do is we can use the last state of the previous sentence. So this is similar to what I talked about here. Um, uh, what I talked about here, but instead of initializing the hidden state of the RNN, um, with the last state of the previous sentence and then modifying that, you instead pass the hidden state um, uh, throughout the entire uh, throughout the entire time. So um, one advantage about RNNs is that it's very conceptually simple to kind of encode all of the information that you've seen before and um, and you know they have theoretically infinite context that you can uh, remember and use. However, um, empirically, well, RNNs can be uh, can be slow, somewhat slow at decoding time, and also empirically, um, people have uh, been moving towards uh, self-attention or transformer models, um, be both because they're uh, they can be faster and also. Um, because they give uh, good empirical results. And um, so there have been moves to uh, do self-attention or transformers across sentences. So the easiest way to do this is similar to the, um, you know, the very simple RNN way, which is you just treat the previous sentences as additional context and um, self-attend to all of the previous words in the document. Um, so, you know, in, if you do this, you don't even have to change your code at all. You just feed in the, um, the previous words. So this is a, a simple way to use document level context. Um, another thing is this can actually learn kind of interesting things. So this is an example on um, using document level context for machine translation. Um, but what you can see is if you look at the, the current sentence, um, or sorry, the current sentence, which is in the rows, and the uh, previous sentence, which is in the columns, um, you have, there was a time I would have lost my heart to a face like yours. And then the next, um, the next sentence is, and you know, and you no doubt would have broken it. So uh, this it, you know, is a pronoun. It's a little bit, uh, ambiguous. And if you want to translate it um, into a language that, for example, has gendered pronouns, you would need to know what the referent of this pronoun was in order to translate it appropriately. And what you can see 
is that indeed um, this model is learning to attend to a uh, heart in the previous sentence uh, when it is encoding it. And uh, you know, this is a good thing because that means you would uh, have a higher chance of being able to translate it appropriately. Um, however, a big problem with this method for incorporating document level context is that computation is quadratic and sequence linked. Um, so, uh, you know, if you have a really, really long sequence of, you know, 1,000 words or 2,000 words or something like that, suddenly you're, um, you're doing a whole lot of computation to incorporate all of the information in, in the past, it, some of it, some of which might not be, you know, very uh, useful uh, for making predictions. So there have been several uh, methods to, um, to handle this, um, and I'm just going to explain a couple of them here. Um, one method, uh, uh, one nice method to do so is transformer XL, um, which was made by uh, Zhang Dai and uh, Jilin Yang here at uh, CMU. But um, basically the, the idea is it's kind of like a combination of a recurrent neural network and a transformer network. So um, I say truncated DPTT here, and this is a truncated backpropagation through time. And, uh, but it's a combination of this uh, concept with uh, the transformer model. Um, and so basically the idea is that we want to attend to uh, fixed uh, vectors from the previous um, uh, sentence. Uh, hang on one second. So, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, so basically, transformer XL. Uh, the way the standard transformer works is um, we uh, um, the way the standard transformer works is basically at training time um, we split the uh, sequence into segments. Um, and within the segment, we can do self-attention over the previous uh, words in the segment um, and use that self-attention to predict the next word um, uh, when we're doing language modeling. However, uh, this is a problem because at the segment boundaries, we aren't able to use any long-term context, um, which is precisely what we want to do. So instead, what Transformer XL does is it steps through uh, a longer sequence, one uh, mini batch at a time. And at each time step, basically it attends to um, all of the things within the segment. And it also attends to the vectors from the previous segment. Um, and what that means is we don't actually back propagate into the vectors here, but we, um, but we can still use the information from them. And um, it's essentially like truncated backprop through time for recurrent neural networks. Um, but we uh, can use the previous states, but we don't backprop into them. Uh, so this has obvious efficiency, uh, um, has obvious efficiency, you know, benefits uh, because we're only attending to, you know, twice as many vectors as opposed to attending to, you know, uh, the whole document, whole previous document. Um, so one nice thing about this is um, if you have a multi-layer transformer model, so like, let's say we have a four-layer transformer model, or I guess this is three, three layers. So if we have three layers of, uh, of transformer, 
and each um, and each segment is a length four. Essentially, what this means is at every time step, we are extending our view of the previous um, uh, of the previous you know words in the context by four, or sorry, so by for each layer. So if we look at this here. This um, uh, word uh, or this vector here is able to attend all the way back to um, up to eight words previous. Uh, so at each uh, layer, we can extend by um, uh, uh, about that, uh, like that number of blocks. So if we have you know ten layers. Um, or if we have eight layers and each uh, uses a block size of 512, then we have eight times 512 uh, worth of history that we could potentially be using to, uh, uh, to attend to. So another option is uh, sparse transformers. And sparse transformers, uh, the way they work is essentially by um, uh, doing uh, alternating layers. So you have one layer which is represented by this dark blue here, and another layer which is uh, represented by this light blue. And um, may maybe the sparse transformer fixed is a little bit easier to, um, to see. Uh, but basically what you do is here, again, the stride is, is four. And so for the the odd layers, you basically attend within a four-word segment. And then for the even layers, oops, sorry. For the even layers, you attend across these four-word segments. So um, by alternating, you basically condense the information in the segment, then expand it across all of the segments, condense the information in the segment, and uh, expand it across all of the, the segments. So, in this particular case, um, instead of being quadratic, n times n squared, uh, you can be um, uh, up to uh, n times square root of n, uh, essentially, by uh, setting the stride equal to the square root of the entire sentence length. So um, all of these have kind of open source implementations. So if you want to use them, uh, you, can, uh, you can look them up online, either Transformer XL or Sparse Transformer. Um, there's also lots of other uh, examples of this, but I, I just thought I'd handle two here. Then uh, finally, how do we evaluate document level models? Um, this, the very simple way of evaluating document level models is um, by evaluating perplexity. Um, so if you, uh, if you want to train a document level language model, you know, theoretically using long-term context should improve uh, your overall capacity as a model. Um, and I, I think you know, perplexity is a good way to evaluate that. The only disadvantage of evaluating perplexity is that if by modeling long-term context, you get worse at short-term context, it's hard to disentangle those, uh, those two effects. Um, I would still argue that perplexity is the best metric that you could be using. But if you want to specifically uh, diagnose uh, long-term dependency effects, um, there's a number of different metrics that have been applied. So one example is, is sentence scrambling. So essentially you scramble the sentences in the document and then you try to uh, put them back in their original order. Um, this was an interesting metric uh, in 2008 when it was first devised, but actually modern models are really, really good at this. And it's almost, uh, you know, the accuracy has almost topped out. So this might be less relevant now. Um, another metric uh, that people have proposed is uh, you have a, a long story and then you try to predict between two human created um, uh, endings to the story. Um, so I, I think this is a kind of interesting metric, but um, uh, you, you need to be very careful about how you create these, uh, these endings to make sure that it's not easy to, uh, to solve without even looking at the context very much. And then uh, final, finally, um, there's also a, uh, 
a task on final word prediction, where you have a, a big set of context. Um, and then you also have uh, a target sentence where you need to predict uh, a word in the target sentence. And um, this, these were specifically designed so that in order to predict the word in the target sentence, you need to have long distance context. So this would be another example. OK, are, are there any uh, questions so far? I had a question, Graham. Uh, yes. Huh. Yeah. So so since the definition of a document is so domain dependent, for example, in the legal domain, it could be 60 pages. And in some other domain, it could be half a page. So when we say document level documents or document level models in, in the context of NLP, do we mean just the models that have lots of context? Um, well, yeah, uh, we, we mean models that have lots of context. So um, the models that have lots of context um, essentially So, so I think it's it's a good question. Um, I, I think a document is basically, if you look at the definition of a document, it's a collection of sentences in a coherent discourse. Um, I actually maybe maybe somebody could actually look that up and and copy and paste it into the chat or something. Like that. But um, uh, the amount of context that you have is going to be very dependent on the type of document it is. So you know, like news stories are kind of the typical thing that people think of as documents, and usually those are, you know, um, twenty sentences or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, very often it is, uh, you know, much much more than that, like an illegal document or something like that. And all of those are within the realm of things that we would like to handle with NLP. Right. So I guess my question rephrased would be at what point can we start calling something a document level model? Does it have to be the case that the model should look at everything included in the definition of document for the given domain? Or is it okay if it's like more than 20 sentences or more than 20 previous sentences? Well, I think a document is, is anything uh, that consists of multiple sentences or you know is a coherent chunk of text within that particular domain. So mm -hmm. I could call anything that satisfies that um, that criteria in the document. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Um, so uh, now I'll, I'll move on to entity co-reference. So entity co-reference um, is basically um, the task of first identifying noun phrases mentioning an entity. Um, notably that this, this can be different from named entity recognition because named entity recognition is basically um, uh, where you want to find things with a name. And here uh, the noun phrases mentioning an entity don't necessarily need to be a name. So for example, her uh, would be an example, husband would be an example. Um, there's also uh, nominals which are a viable monarch um, a re renowned speech therapist, and these also uh, can be co-referent in, in some definitions. Um, then after you've identified these noun phrases, uh, which are called mentions, um, that are referring to the same underlying world entity, you want to cluster them together. So basically have an idea of uh, which are uh, corresponding to each other. So mention detection. Um, uh, this is not trivial. Um, so here we have a renowned speech therapist was summoned to help the king overcome his speech impediment. Um, and how do we chunk these appropriately? It could be a renowned speech therapist, um, or it could be a renowned speech. So, um, you know, this might seem simple and trivial to, uh, to people, but um, this is a place where many automatic models make mistakes. Um, and then you can think of uh, co-reference as basically a clustering problem given the noun phrases. Um, and know knowing these uh, correct noun phrases does affect the result a lot. 
so um, components of a co-reference model, um, like a traditional machine learning model, we need to know the instances, um, for example, uh, shift reduce operations and parsing, and we need to define features that we will um, be using to uh, select the correct answer for each of these instances. And we would also like to optimize towards the evaluation metrics that are corresponded with our final downstream use case. Um, and also, uh, this is a structured prediction problem. So the assignment of um, entities to clusters, of course, is a combinatorial optimization problem. So we need to have some sort of search algorithm for this structure, underlying structure. So um, for co-reference models, um, we have uh, instances. So if we think of co-reference as a structured prediction problem, um, we, uh, yeah, as I said, the number of cluster structures is exponential in the number of dimensions. It's equal to the number of partitions of dimensions into clusters. Um, so models are designed to explore this space. Um, and the core difference is the way each instance is constructed. And there's mention-based uh, entity ba and entity-based um, uh, methods for doing so. So for example, an, a mention-based method might treat um, Hillary Clinton, Clinton, she, and Bill Clinton as, uh, as different uh, thing, things. And um, when we get Bill Clinton, we would like to know which uh, mention to link to. Um, and so a mention-based model would look at Hillary Clinton, Clinton, she, and Bill Clinton uh, all separately. And then if Hillary Clinton and she were uh, kind of mixed together, an entity-based model uh, would treat Hillary Clinton and she as one and the same. So mentioned pair models are one variety of models. Um, the simplest method is basically we want to classify the co-reference relation between every pair of two mentions. Um, so for example, here uh, we have Queen Elizabeth and her would be a positive example. And then Queen, Queen Elizabeth and husband, King George, uh, the king and his um, would all be negative examples. And then of course, uh, husband and King George uh, would be a positive example, et cetera. So this is simple. Um, the advantage is that this is simple, obviously, you know, we're, we're just taking in a pair of entities and trying to classify a binary decision problem over them. Um, but there are many drawbacks, so there, it may result in conflicts. So for example, what if you classified um, two pairs of mentions as, uh, like two pairs of mentions as being co-referent, but then the other one, uh, the other edge of the triangle was not, um, uh, predicted as uh, is true. Another problem is that there's too many negative training instances. So, you know, most pairs of entities are not going to be co-referent. It also makes it very hard to capture entity or cluster level features. So for example, um, if we have the king, um, uh, well, okay, yeah, sorry, this is not the best example. I'll, I'll show an example later. And another thing is um, it makes it more difficult to uh, rank the consistency of instances or uh, et cetera. So entity models, uh, such as entity mention models, basically try to create an instance between a mention and a previous cluster. So um, usually the process will follow the natural discourse order, which means that every you start at the beginning of the document and you gradually transition to the end of the document. Um, and every time you see a new entity, you try to decide whether that, or sorry, every time you see a new mention, you try to decide whether that mention corresponds to an entity that you've already seen before or is part of a completely new cluster. Um, so the advantage of this is that you can create cluster level features. So um, for example, are the genders of all of the entities in the cluster compatible. So if you know that um, a name was a female name and then you have she um, uh, later in the document, uh, that would be an example of a good feature. 
uh, for that cluster. And if the name was a female name and then you have he later in the document, then that would be a, a negative example. Um, so another uh, problem, another example is, does the cluster contain only pronouns? And that's usually indicative of a problem because you usually don't have pronouns without the mention of the entity itself. So um, these models have been around for a long time. So you know they've been around since at least 2005. Um, but uh, one big advance of neural network models is that it made uh, training these more sophisticated methods uh, easier. So for example, uh, you know, how do we devise cluster level features would not be trivial in previous models. But in, this, uh, in the case of neural networks, we can directly learn the features with embeddings. Um, another advantage that we have is we can train towards the metric uh, if we want, using reinforcement learning or margin-based methods. Um, finally, we can uh, jointly perform mention detection and, uh, and clustering. So um, to give some examples of neural network models for uh, uh, entity co-reference, um, this is a co-reference resolution with entity-level distributed representations. And basically, the way the model works, oh, let me put the model up here. So um, basically, it's a mentioned pair uh, representation. So we have, um, uh, it's a mentioned pair model and a cluster pair model to capture representations. So um, uh, typical co-reference features are used, but they use uh, embeddings. Um, so, for example, you have an embedding of the candidate antecedent, um, some features of the candidate antecedent, um, uh, some embeddings of the mention itself, uh, and some of the features of the mention, and then um, uh, pair and document features as well. So if it's a particular type of, type of document, you would add those. And then once you have all of the mention pair representations, you can then pool them together and uh and turn them into a cluster uh cluster pair representation so um uh that allows you to evaluate the equivalence over the cluster or the the score of the, is a cluster um so this is one example of how you can encode the uh you know use embeddings to encode this. And uh, further, people have applied uh, reinforcement learning for mention ranking co-reference co models. So it's a continuation of the previous model with the same features and structure, but they changed the objective uh, to use reinforcement learning to directly optimize the objectives that we care about uh, in co-reference. And um, basically choosing which previous antecedent to uh, choose is considered an action of the agent as you read through the discourse. And um, the final reward is one of the uh, evaluation metrics in uh, co-reference. And um, so this basically shows that you can tune the model directly towards uh, optimizing the metric that you care about. Um, so, so this is an example of a kind of early work that came up with, uh, you know, neural models in a similar way that were done uh, previously. Um, yeah, I'll just skip the, this. But the um, kind of a big revolution in this field happened in this end-to-end uh, -end neural co-reference model, um, which had essentially two major contributions. The first is, can we represent all of the features um, uh, in a way more typical of neural network embeddings? So um, can we you know, uh, use all that we know about neural networks uh, to represent the features? And also, um, can the neural network allow the uh, errors to flow end to end all the way back to mention detection? So as I mentioned uh, earlier in the um, uh, in the class, um, mention detection is actually surprisingly hard here. 
And if you make mistakes in mention detection, you do uh, much worse in downstream co-reference. So can we train the neural network to go all the way uh, from mention detection to, to co-reference? So the way this model works is um, it's a end-to-end uh, -end, uh, neural co-reference model. Um, it's a span-based model. So basically uh, what they do is they first run an encoder in the form of a bidirectional uh, LSTM um, that uses this uh, span um, that, that encodes each of the words basically within context. And then um, when you encode a new uh, each span to make a decision about whether it's a co-reference span, you take the first vec vector in the span, the last vector in the span, and also the attentional sum of the uh, of all of the vectors inside the span and concatenate these all into uh, one, big, um, one big representation for the span. Um, so once you do this, uh, you can then um, take the uh, mention score. So basically, the mention, what the mention score is, is it's a score that determines whether the span is likely to be a mention at all. So this is kind of like the span detection model. And then in addition to the, the mentioned score for each span, you also have a score that's calculated as the antecedent score. And um, this also feeds into the final overall choice of whether uh, uh, these two spans are co-referent. And based on this, you can then take a softmax over all the possible um, antecedent uh, spans and select the one that has the highest probability and optimize this model so that it correctly chooses uh, antecedents. So one nice thing about this model, so one, so the obvious nice thing about this model is it's end-to-end -end trainable. It's going all the way from span detection, uh, learning the representations of the span, et cetera, to performing co-reference. The problem with this model is because now instead of extracting spans as a pre-processing step, you're trying to learn them within one big neural model. And because of this, um, it's slow. You know, it's unwieldy to calculate the, uh, you know, the probability of all pairs of spans. And in fact, um, uh, the, uh, in fact, if you think about how, um, uh, how many pairs of spans there would be, it wouldn't just be quadratic in the sequence length. It would be quadratic in the sequence length times the maximum length of a span. So if you have a document with 512, um, 512 possible spans, uh, uh, sorry, a uh, document with length of 512, and the span length is potentially up to 10, then you would have 5,120 uh, uh, possible spans there, or a, a little bit less than that, but you know, nearly 5,000 spans. And uh, then you would need to take all pairs of 5,000 spans. So that obviously very quickly becomes uh, un infeasible. So one other clever thing about this method here is that um, they have this mention score here. And if this mention score is very bad, you can just kind of assume that this is not likely to be a mention at all. Um, so what they do is they first calculate the mention score, then they prune away all of the spans with a low enough mention score. And um, then they only calculate these antecedent scores between the spans that weren't pruned away in this pruning process. Um, so by doing this, that makes it feasible to calculate this over big documents. Um, so I, I think this is a really um, nice and interesting uh, model. And in fact, uh, so much so that um, uh, we have recently uh, um, made an expansion on this model um, that uh, applies it to other kinds of tasks as well. So um, I can uh, show the paper um, if, uh, if archive is not down. I got a question. I see the question, and I'll explain it in a second. 
Um, so we have this uh, we we have this paper that takes a very uh, similar approach to doing natural language analysis, um, but our uh, our observation is essentially that it's not just coreference that can be modeled in this way, but also many other um, many other uh, related tasks. So, um, for example, semantic role labeling which is the task of uh, discovering uh, semantics between pr uh, predicates like brought and their arguments, is also um, coming up with uh, you know, identifying spans and calculating the relations between the spans. Um, open information extraction is also uh, identifying spans and calculating relations be between the spans, dependency parsing, um, et cetera. So, um, if you're interested, uh, I, I think this is a, a nice illustration of how this uh, can be, uh, this model can be applied to other uh, things as well. So I got a question, um, how do you backprop through the pruning op operations? And so this is a very good question. Um, pruning is not, uh, is not differentiable. Um, it, it's not a differentiable process. However, um, what pruning is, is doing is it's basically um, uh, it's basically um, removing some of the candidates from a candidate list. And what what that's like is it's like taking the top candidates and multiplying you know their probability or whatever by one, and taking the bottom candidates and multiplying their probability by zero. So all of the bottom candidates, you stop the gradient going into the bottom candidates, but you still have the gradient going into all of the top candidates. So as long as your probability, as long as you have more than one candidate in that top candidate list, it's still calculating the relative probability within the top candidates, so you can backprop into all of them. And very often that's enough because you know if it realizes that some of the candidates at the bottom of the list should actually have higher probability, it will move them up towards the top of the list. And in doing so, it might also move some candidates that were pruned in this particular epoch back up into the list and reconsider them. So uh, that's the, if you're taking an n best, um, you are removing some of the things and stopping the gradient into them, but then you still have the other ones. Um, okay, are there any other questions? It's a good question. So um, I, I've been talking about how you can uh, figure how can you how you can figure out uh, co-reference or how you can attempt to analyze co-reference. Um, there's also uh, methods that um, can use co-reference in neural models. So, uh, for example, co-reference-aware uh, language modeling. Um, so what what they do is basically they um, they model the uh, state um, where they feed in uh, the state from previous co-referent uh, words. So if you know that Linda um, uh, has, is, oh, sorry, uh, um, I and you are co-referent, then you can feed in the, uh, the state of I uh, next time when, you're, uh, when you have predicted you. Uh, later. Um, but perhaps more interestingly, um, there's co-reference aware QA models. And the co-reference aware QA models do a similar thing where they, um, uh, they basically share the representations uh, between the co-referent um, words through a graph neural network. Um, so I, I think this is, this is interesting. I, I think um, there, you may make an argument that big pre-trained models like um, like BERT or you know what whatever uh, other one you may be using um, can already capture this to some extent uh, in their representations, but um, you can also make arguments that uh, running these uh, big QA models over a huge document and trying to pass information through co-reference chains. Uh, kind of implicitly won't do as well as um, uh, you know having a more explicit formulation of this. So I, I 
don't know for sure whether people have tested this in, uh, you know, in any detail recently, but I, I think it's, uh, uh, it would be an interesting question to re-ask in 2020. Um, okay. So, uh, so that was about co-reference. Um, next, I'm going to be talking about uh, discourse parsing. So discourse parsing, basically what it is, is it's like um, parsing over words, like we talked about before, uh, constituency parsing, but um, uh, over sentences, or not necessarily sentences, but uh, something called elementary discourse units. So what an elementary discourse unit is, is basically um, a small piece of text that corresponds to one. I actually, I don't remember the, the real definition. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I don't wanna like, it kind of intuitively it's something like one, it's a little bit like one thought or one, you know, um, uh, one immediate piece of argumentation, for example. Um, but to give a few examples, um, uh, only the midday sun at tropical latitudes is warm enough uh, to thaw ice on occasion. Um, so the reason why these are split into two units is because basically the to thaw ice on occasion is a purpose, um, is in a purpose link here. And then you have but any liquid water formed in this way would evaporate almost instantly because of the low atmospheric pressure. So the because is kind of in an explanation of this. And then these are both connected by a but. So then you're contrasting these two, uh, these two units. So you can see how you kind of build up a tree of the whole discourse uh, where there are relations between each of these trees. So, um, <clears throat> The, uh, basically, the, there's a lot of, um, or there's some work on, uh, on doing this sort of parsing. And the way it works is, or kind of the intuition behind it is that, number one, you need to identify um, at each kind of elementary span level what the relation is between them. And then you gradually move up the tree to larger and larger um, you know, chunks, and we would still like to be able to identify the relationship between the larger chunks. And because of this, kind of a tree-structured neural network seems to be a good, uh, a good fit for this problem. Um, so early work on this uh, basically used a recursive uh, neural network for discourse parsing. Um, and it first determined whether two spans should be merged together, so whether, um, whether there was a relationship between them. And then after you determine whether two spans should be merged together, you determine the relation type. And um, then this uh, was further uh, expanded to basically apply attention to this problem. So you had attention over each of the words in the ele elementary discourse unit. Um, you would do attention over these words to get a single vector. Um, and then you would, uh, you know, have a span level uh, by LSTM, and then you would uh, do attention over them to get the vector, et cetera. So you would gradually move up the tree uh, like that. So um, I, th I think the, uh, the details of the model are um, a little bit less important here, but I, I think one interesting thing is as you start to get to this discourse structure, um, as you start to get up to the document level, uh, you can actually incorporate the structure in models in interesting ways and get reasonable improvements. Um, so to give a really interesting example of this, um, it's this paper by G and Smith, where they have the, uh, the RST or rhetorical structure theory trees. And then they use these trees essentially to figure out which, um, which elements in this, uh, in the entire uh, document are the more important ones. 
Um, so they model, um, they basically take the, uh, the composition function and using the, um, uh, using the types of discourse relations, this allows you to inform the model of what, uh, what parts you should be focusing on when you, um, when you make your classification. And they have a specific model that looks um, like this, where basically the, the alphas here are kind of the weighting factors that you put on, the, uh, on each of the discourse relations. Um, so overall, uh, this gets uh, good results. And um, more interestingly, uh, discourse parsing accuracy is very important to get this, um, to improve the uh, model uh, like qualities. So um, you can see the, the classification accuracy on Yelp reviews, um, they basically ablated away different parsers um, to create parsers with better discourse parsing accuracy or worse discourse parsing accuracy. And you can see that the accuracy of the discourse parser itself uh, was very well correlated with the um, uh, with the classification accuracy that you got in the downstream model. So I think this is interesting because it basically shows number one that the discourse parsing is useful, but also number two that um, the discourse parsing accuracy of sixty two percent that we have right now. Is, um, is a major barrier to getting these models to work. So it, it is uh, worth basically putting more effort into uh, being able to perform accurate discourse parsing. So um, I guess that's all I have for today. Sorry, actually this was, uh, this was shorter than I imagined. Um, but uh, are, are there any questions about this or about document level uh, um, models in general that I could answer.